Hello, my name is Jacob Callahan. I'm a quality engineer with Satellite 6, and today I'm going to be talking to you about testing software with machine learning. So machine learning is a pretty broad topic. Um, so basically the focus on this is to kind of give you an introduction to it, um, my ideas for potential and actual uh, uses for it in software testing, and I'll also be telling you um, what I've done so far, my future goals, and where I'd like to see uh, QE or any type of QE organization move forward in the future towards a better uh, testing environment. So first, what is machine learning? Machine learning is a subset of the overall artificial intelligence. Um, it's, it's kind of the thing that's really popular right now, um, whereas other parts of artificial intelligence have kind of you know, gone by the wayside. Machine learning has um, a lot of very um, real world applications and they're fairly uh, easy to get set up in some fields. Um, some fields are a bit more difficult and one of those more difficult fields is quality engineering. Um, but hopefully, um, myself and anyone else interested will help to uh, lower the bar to entry for that. It's basically the process or the ability for a machine or a computer to automatically learn. Um, whatever it's trying to learn, whatever task you set forward, uh, we're going to be using a subset of um, algorithms to help it actually move towards an explicit goal. Um, is Contrary to what our traditional testing is, where we um, explicitly program out test cases, uh, here it actually explores the program and um, figures out what works and what doesn't work. And machine learning, in my opinion, is applicable to almost any field. I say almost any because I'm sure there's something out there where you know machine learning can't be useful, um, but I don't know of it. And in, again, my opinion, it is the future of software testing. All right, so let's go through the first steps. Um, I'll be covering here in the next few slides how to create an interface, um, input generation, gathering information, our initial testing, and then additionally cleanup. All right, so for creating an interface, an interface is basically what you're going to use um, for your machine learning setup um, to interact with your product. It's kind of a, a layer of abstraction where the machine learning um, program doesn't actually have to worry about connecting to whatever your product is. It doesn't have to worry about, you know, um, SSL certificates or any weird things that have to be done to actually uh, communicate with your product's API or whatever interface you want it to go against. If you run automated tests, you probably have an interface already for this. Um, for example, RZA, which is the uh, tool that I'll be uh, demoing later, uh, uses Nailgun to interact with the Satellite 6 API. And I kind of focused uh, RZA um, to work pretty well with Nailgun. And if anyone wants to create an interface and pop it into RZA, they'd have to follow um, Nailgun's uh, basis for how it actually creates entities, methods, and fields, etc. So an entity, at least for Nailgun and RZA as that's concerned, is basically any type of part of the project um, that you can actually interface with. So for satellite, we have entities that are consisting of organizations, lifecycle environments, uh, products, repositories, hosts, etc. So it's basically the things that you actually care about um, that actually, you know, kind of exist within your product itself. Now we have methods, which are basically the actions that can be done through or to an entity. So for an organization, which is one of the most simple things that you can create in satellite, um, 
you can basically do a method to create it, uh, to download a debug certificate, and delete it, etc. Uh, fields are actually what um, Nailgun uses to instantiate the entity class itself. So for, again, we're going to use an organization pretty wildly uh, through here. So for an organization, it has um, a name, it could potentially be associated with um, particular users. Um, basically, anything that kind of is a component of the entity is considered a field. And then next, we'll be talking about input itself. OK, so for input, this is probably the easiest way to get started. Um, input, at its most basic level, is just generating something that can go into um, either a method or a field to give it some type of value. Um, Riza mainly uses Fofactory for its basic input. Uh, more recently, I've given it um, kind of a, a helping hand with a little bit more smarter um, input methods, such as actually generating a specific repository type, whether that be uh, yum, puppet, uh, docker, file type as well as um, the ability to actually point to real locations. So um, a repository URL or a Puppet repository URL. Um, this is something that can theoretically be stumbled upon, but the likelihood of it uh, generating a true string to that actual location is uh, very remote. It'll probably take um, more time than you have to sit around and have it do its thing, or most likely more time than the entire life cycle of your product. So while basic input is pretty easy, um, more challenging for higher level input is um, significantly more difficult unless you give it a, a way to help um, itself. And we'll cover a bit more of that later on. On this uh, bottom line here, I say that uh, we'll use entity creation functions in the future. I guess I should update this because uh, one of my most recent um, changes to RZA actually allows it to use genetic algorithms to recursively um, either attempt to create an entity or use what it actually knows how to do to fulfill any type of requirements that may be in a field here. So if a life cycle environment requires an organization and the organization is already um, known or we already know how to make an organization, it can do that on the fly and supply that to the life cycle environment when it tries to create it. All right, the next step is gathering, in inform is gathering information. Um, we need a lot of information to model behavior and make predictions. This is especially true if you're using any of the traditional machine learning approaches, whether that be uh, neural networks, support vector um, machines, etc. Um, and one way to go about this is to process current test automation logs. Um, for us, we log all of our stuff. So um, what we submit to the API, what gets returned from the API, all gets logged. Um, you could have it parse through that, uh, pick out what was submitted, what was returned, and then actually try to um, form predictions based off of that. Another way to go is to start from scratch. So for starting from scratch, uh, one of the easiest ways to get started um, but takes the most time is brute force testing. And what I mean by this is it will test every entity every method for that entity, um, every input that could possibly go into the method or the fields for those entities. Um, it'll test every single combination. And as you can uh, guess from that, it takes a lot of time. For a very simple entity, you could easily be upwards to about a couple trillion tests. Uh, and still barely scratch the surface of um, everything that can be done to it, especially if you put in a lot of input methods. Um, a smarter way to go about this is the use of genetic algorithms, and this is where RZA is right now. It's uh, significantly smarter than brute force, um, 
it's kind of similar in its initial um, startup, but as it gets um, values back and starts to learn from the feedback, it'll adjust the way that it tests in order for it to actually find um, a way forward to creating what you want to create. Um, one thing that hasn't been done yet, um, but I'm still considering, is using what's known as simulated annealing. Um, it's a better form of hill climbing. If you're familiar with hill climbing, um, then you'll get what this means. Um, but basically within machine learning, and um, I'm sure other fields as well, uh, hill climbing is the process of starting in one location and then finding a higher point just around you and moving to that and then starting over. So you continually find a higher point, higher point, higher point until you can get to the top of that hill. Um, one thing that is a challenge with simulated annealing is that you can reach a local hill, but in order to get to the highest hill in the area, you'd have to start down. So unless you account for that, then you're going to get stuck in a, what's known as a local maximum. All right, cleanup. Now, this is something that's actually uh, pretty important, something that I've uh, encountered a bit more than I expected with RZA. Uh, during the first couple of weeks that I was testing the genetic algorithms, um, you can see the results on the right. It created almost uh, 13,000 organizations, um, almost 10,000 locations, and within the default organization itself, about 1,500 products. Uh, this actually put the satellite I was testing it on in, in a pretty bad state where some pages absolutely refused to load. However, the API was still pretty responsive. And this is because we're going to be testing on a massive scale. Um, it's not something that any of our traditional testing frameworks ever um, put out to our products. So for satellite, we've got maybe about a thousand or so tests that we run. Um, through our different tiers. Um, this will be running uh, potentially millions or billions of tests depending on what method you're initially going to get started. So with that, systems will need to be cleaned regularly. Uh, you can either use the product-based cleaning methods. Um, hopefully your installer or something has some type of um, uh, refresh or way to drop the database and clean everything up. Um, however, in my opinion, VM snapshots might be the best option. So you do a clean and solve your product, uh, run all the tests on it, get it really nice and messy. And then once you're good with that for now, just revert to a previous snapshot and start all over again. All right, so on to my pet project, which is RZA. Um, what is it? <laughs> Why is it? And how is it? and also the current state. And as you can see on the bottom right, this is the GitHub link to it. Um, feel free to check it out. I've got some pretty decent documentation in the README, at least enough to get you started. And as always, PRs are always welcome. So what is RZA? Uh, first, we'll talk about the name. Uh, I initially was going to call it Robotello Zombie Apocalypse. Robotello is our uh, testing framework for satellite. Uh, the zombie apocalypse part is because, as I mentioned earlier, if you're doing some type of brute force or genetic algorithm-based testing, um, you're basically going to be sending a lot of dumb things at your product. Um, at least with genetic algorithms, eventually it'll get smarter, so uh, some zombies will get through and uh, find your way into either parts that you don't want your product to uh, get hit or things that you do want to. Um, so as I went about that, I shortened it to Robotello-ZA since Zombie Apocalypse is fairly long. And then I was building my Docker images, just RZA, which I pronounced RZA. So that's how we have the actual name itself. So what is it? It's my initial project for incorporating machine learning techniques in software testing. Um, it's been something that I've been wanting to do for a few years now. Um, finally um, took the time in my off time to really start working on it and fleshing it out. Um, it's an easy CLI for understanding and uh, testing your interface. Uh, the reason why is that machine learning has a steep 
learning curve. Um, it's getting a bit better now, but at least uh, four or five years ago, if you read any subject about machine learning, it most likely didn't have um, any or at least sparse code in it. Uh, everything was in mathematical notation and uh, used um, master's level um, wording for everything that needs to be done. And it took quite a bit of research to get the background just to get started in the most basic things. And nobody really has time to re reinvent the wheel. So I wanted um, RZA to be a common platform where um, myself and others can work on putting the uh, basic techniques in there and then others can come in later and either plug in an interface or use our high-level functions to actually um, do things like use neural networks, use genetic algorithms um, without having to worry about what they are or even uh, more so how to actually write in a genetic algorithm or neural network from scratch. Um, with that, I wanted to um, be able to plug in an interface and start testing quickly. Um, at this point, if you have a interface that's similar to Nailgun, you basically just have to ch change one or two imports and then update the configuration and you're good to go. I also wanted it to be distributed for parallel testing and I do that um, through Docker. Uh, the way that it does the... Um, the plug and play is the interface, um, which of course abstracts away this product specifics, is automatically detected. Um, it pulls in any entities, methods, fields, and input methods that you provide, and then it'll use that uh, going forward. All right, so for its current state, as I said, it automatically detects the entities, fields, uh, methods of the interface. It can also automatically detect the input methods from Faux Factory, and you can also provide custom input methods in an input file, which is just basically a collection of functions. You can um, export, import, run brute force tests against a specific entity. Um, you can also do genetic algorithm based testing, um, which allows for um, recursive dependency resolution. And you're also able to prune out anything, which I can show you later. As I said, it's also dockerized for distribution and parallelization. So if you wanted to export a bunch of brute force tests um, to uh, text files, you can split that up uh, uh, across a number of Docker containers and then have them run each of those um, that you specify. So some of the things that are a bit of a work in progress are smarter input methods, so we can create uh, more complex entities, um, neural networks, and then asynchronous task execution. Now, one thing to note about the uh, async task ex execution is uh, my initial uh, attempts with this against uh, brute force testing um, sent way too many requests to my satellite at once, and it almost immediately broke it. So that's one thing to note. I think before we move on, yep, before we move on, I'm going to give you guys a quick demo of what RZA is so you can kind of get a better idea of um, what exactly I'm talking about. All right, so RZA has a pretty decent interface right now. Um, the main components of it are uh, brute force testing, genetic testing. You can also uh, show and modify the configuration uh, to a limited extent modification uh, through the CLI. You can list out what Risen knows and then more importantly for um, running in a containerized environment, you can have it test itself through PyTest. So let's get started with uh, a little bit of brute force testing. All right, so here's our help output for this. Um, we have the entities that you want to test, um, the 
output path. So if you want to just um, export the task without actually running them, you can specify a file to write all the generated tests to. You can have it import tests from a predefined file, which I'll show you in just a minute. Um, you can also specify the name of the log to write to. Everything um, logging wise is done through a nice little module called log zero, which if you don't have one for your project already, I'd recommend at least for Python developers, log zero, because it's pretty nice. Um, one thing that I do highly recommend is you take advantage of these next four um, fields, which is the max fields, which is the maximum number of entity fields to use, uh, maximum inputs, which as the name would apply is the max number of input methods to use, uh, field exclude, so you can exclude um, different things like a label, an ID, etc. that really don't make too much sense for actually uh, creating or testing your entity, but were made available by um, your interface just for either internal things or for printing out information. Also, you can exclude different types of method, um, methods that were made available by your interface, like for um, Nailgun, there are a number of things for basically um, getting different types of information back from uh, your entity, such as um, getting a raw version of what was returned from the API, um, searching, just reading the entity itself, um, doing the actual get method, uh, which is the API call, and then actually showing the, uh, the payload of the call itself. That's not really too useful for um, what we're concerned about for testing it. Um, at this point, so you can just go ahead and exclude them because if you don't take advantage of these four fields, you can easily get the trillions or so tests that I was talking about earlier. And uh, just like with um, genetic algorithm based testing, which I'll give you after this, um, you can also do debug output as well because these things can get uh, pretty verbose if you um, don't limit it. Um, as far as debugging. All right, so let's go ahead and show you um, just a quick brute force example um, from his stored file. So we'll do Rizzo brute-i, and we're going to use um, our example.txt here, which just is 10 stored tests um, that are predefined just to kind of help you get started and kind of demo what they can do. So while it's running, you can see the initial test that was um, run here. Everything's kind of delimited by a tilde because that's kind of an uncommon character in um, most English languages. Um, you can also see the result. We can see that it passed and then the results of that pass. And then finally, what it'll also give you is the actual values that it created here. Um, while this is still running, let's scroll up so it doesn't keep um, keep going. We can see what's in there. So our entity is a product. We can see that the method was create uh, JSON. The field dictionary that was used um, passed in a label to it. And the input method was gen UUID, which is a faux factory method to, as you would think, generate a UUID. Uh, for the arc dictionary, um, Nailgun has a trick in it that's called uh, create missing, which it will actually um, create anything that would be needed to actually instantiate an entity. And for that, just basically any type of positive value um, that actually exists can be passed in and it will um, put it on its way. So we saw that it was passed, and here's all the results uh, from that, all the way up to this point. So this is everything that's returned from the API. All right, and then I'll, at the uh, very end here, we can see what um, each of those resolved to. So we're, as you saw before, we have gen UID for the label. We see that it actually produced this UID. And then for the create missing, it produced this URL instead of gen URL. Uh, the way that I 
the reason why I did it this way is that way you don't have fixed tests being saved where every single time um, the label will be generated with U, this UUID, it'll just use the general method and at runtime, it will um, call that method and actually get a unique value from it every single time. This way you have um, repeatable tests that won't conflict with each other and um, it's, it's a bit more concise as well, which is nice. All right, so everything finished and we're good to go there. Um, let me just go ahead and show you real quick what the example.txt file is. And here is just the JSON uh, format where we see the test itself with all the different fields um, and everything populated. And this is, like I said, is um, put in a way that it's a repeatable tests that can be run consistently uh, since we don't actually have the uh, individual values in there, but just the input methods. Yep. I think my caps lock was on. Yep. Okay, so now let's go ahead into the part that I'm more excited about, which is genetic algorithm-based testing. It's RZA genetic. Kind of overflowed a bit at the top there, but you don't need all that. Similarly uh, to brute force testing, um, you do have to specify uh, an entity. Um, you can also specify a individual method. So um, it defaults to create, but in here, um, if you have something like a repository, you can also specify sync or of course, you know, delete for anything, um, basically any type of action that your entity is able to do and is provided by your interface, you would specify through the method. Um, the rest of these are all populated by default as well, but you can override them um, either through the configuration or at runtime. So we have the population count right here, which is the number of organisms in each generation. So for each generation, it's gonna run this number of tests. Um, we have our maximum number of generations, so if we don't want this thing running forever, if we can't figure it out, we can stop it at, say, 100 or 1,000 generations, and if it hasn't completed by that point, it'll save what the best thing it has created uh, till then, and then it'll exit out. So it can either continue on from where you, from where you uh, left off, or you can use the, uh, the prune flag to delete anything that hasn't actually succeeded. So for our um, max recursive generations, this is um, also pretty important. Um, the genetic algorithm based testing has a ability to recursively um, fill any dependencies that uh, may be required. So if it sees that um, an entity has the field for an organization, it'll try to create an organization and pass that at runtime. And then our max recurse steps, this is also important if you just decide to keep recursion on uh, because a number of things uh, also have uh, kind of circular dependencies. So if you create a, um, a host group in satellite, um, it requires different entities that also require other entities, which require other entities as well. And some of them reference each other so they could be um, winding down this unending whole of uh, dependencies. So if we limit our max recursive depth, it'll stop that at a particular point. So it can't go any further trying to resolve them um, and at least keep us out of some type of infinite recursive loop. We also have the ability to um, what I call seek bad. So if we don't want to do the proper way of creating an entity, we just want to try the create method, but get as bad results as we possibly can. We can use that uh, seek bad flag and it'll just keep doing uh, the worst things it can possibly figure out. This is a good way of uh, finding um, weakness or flaws in your product. Uh, you can have it kind of seek out uh, 500 ISEs or any other type of um, output that you want to get from it. 
Um, you can also uh, disable dependencies, which um, will also disable recursion, um, but disabling dependencies as a whole will stop it from creating any type of required entities that it either knows or doesn't know how to create. This is um, a good way to get started for uh, simple entities like an organization that don't require anything else from the product to be created. You can, as I alluded to earlier, disable recursion. So um, it'll disable it from attempting to create anything it doesn't already know how to create. Um, if you have tests that are already saved in there, so if it already knows how to create a product um, and you want it to start over um, fresh, uh, by default, the genetic tester doesn't do that. It'll actually load um, the latest best thing that it has for that particular entity and continue on. And then you can prune any of your entities. This is a good way to not only um, find kind of the difference between one product version and another. Um, if it worked on one particular uh, version, say like, you know, for satellite, it would be 6.2.13, and now we're testing 6.2.14. I can just run a prune on there, and it'll run all the tests that it knows, uh, all the positive tests that it knows already work. And if it finds anything that doesn't, it'll uh, notify you and remove them. Um, maybe in the future, I'll do like a dash dash prune, no commit or something, so it'll just notify you what isn't working and then go from there. But this is a good um, kind of positive check to see what's going on. So enough talk with that. Let's actually um, do it. RZA genetic dash E. So our entity will be just a simple organization. And since I'm not specifying fresh, it's going to um, pull in the latest best one that we have saved and run that. So we see here a success message that generates in zero, passed with, and here's the test that it actually wrote. Um, so we can see that our object, again, uses created missing. Uh, our entity is organization, and here are the different fields that were used to actually create that, as well as the input methods. And then, of course, at the end, our default is for the method to be create. So they use create. All right, now let's go ahead and show you a little bit more for this. Um, we'll start it from fresh. We'll disable any dependencies. And we'll also enable debug output so you can see what's going on underneath the hood. Oh, I just realized I don't have an extra dash in there, so that would not have gone well. All right, let's run it. And we can see already that um, there's a bit more output in here. You can see um, that it's testing an organism. It'll tell you that it's uh, executing the test. It'll give the results. And then we continue down, and then we see that eventually uh, it tested an organization with um, this input. The test passed, and we can see the return results from the API. And we see here that it passed with uh, very minimal stuff because it actually, again, is smart enough to use the create missing part of the test itself. All right, so all of these tests are by default stored in data genetic tests. And in here, we can see all of the organizations, sorry, all the entities um, that RZA has uh, successfully been able to test, um, whether that be uh, creating it, deleting it, etc. So quite a few. And let's actually look into that, the file of the organization, so data check test organization. And we can see that we have two tests that are saved in here right now, uh, create positive and then delete positive. Um, as we saw earlier, uh, the one that we just ran actually overwrote the, uh, the previous test since it's the most recent to succeed. 
And then we also have a uh, delete positive test in here as well. This is a good way for you to um, check back in whenever something is completed and actually see what it's been doing. Um, if you've really wanted to, you could come in here and um, change any of these values for whatever reason or specify um, different kind of tests that you'd maybe like to run on the fly. There. And we'll just run a quick prune. Where's a genetic dash E. For pruning, you can specify um, all. It'll run through everything that's uh, stored in this directory and try them out. All dash dash prune. And here we go. So it's going to go through each one of those files, pull out all the positive tests, um, run them. If it finds something that it can't do anymore, it'll give you a warning saying that it uh, removes uh, a particular test, which in this um, instance is compute profile delete positive from the file itself. And if that just happens to delete the remaining files, uh, the remaining test from that file, it'll also delete the file. So you don't have to have a directory that's sitting full of um, empty files. So we'll let this complete. Then I'll show you a few more things with RZA and then get back to the slides themselves. All right, we're done. All right, so as I was saying before, everything that um, Risen knows is loaded at runtime. And you can see that um, if you use the uh, list method. Here you can see our positional arguments. Um, you can list out the entities, methods, fields, arguments, and input methods that are available. And then for some of those, you will have to specify an entity and a method. So if we want to list out our entities, it's just as simple as this. There's a list entities. And now we can see everything that's made available by Nailgun. Um, it doesn't filter out uh, by default all the different things um, that aren't actually true satellite entities, but are still made available by uh, Nailgun. See so here we have an abstract compute resource. We also have... Um, the mixins that basically make up uh, entities themselves as a base class. But we also do see uh, the satellite parts itself, like a uh, package, package content view filter, um, our very famous uh, organization. Uh, you can also list out the methods, we'll say for an organization. So this is everything that RZA, um, through Nailgun, knows how to do to, to an organization. Leave that there. And if you watched my other presentation at any point, you know that I'm a pretty big fan of containers. So of course, I containerized it. Um, it's, it's pretty easy uh, to run it through a container. It's all available on Docker Hub as well. If you want to just pull that down and just get started, you will have to modify a configuration file. Um, and I'll show you where that is here in just a second. So the command is simple, docker run. We're going to remove it afterwards. We're going to mount the RZA directory so we can not only pull in uh, whatever our configuration is, but also pull in any test that we want to run um, and actually store the results. So make it actually useful and not just print output to a screen and we can't do anything but maybe copy it off the screen if we really wanted to. Um, by default, it has an entry point of RZA with a modifier of help. So you don't actually have to um, type RZA at the very end of it. Um, as I stated before, it has a self-testing method um, using PyTest, so you can just do um, docker run, etc. 
test and you can specify any type of um, PyTest arguments using the dash dash args flag. So we'll run that now. And we see that all of our tests passed. All right, lastly, let's go into our config. And in here, um, by default, when you pull down the project, you'll get the uh, Rizzle YAML example, as well as the uh, server configs JSON example. This is more Nailgun specific, but um, you can override all these values um, after you copy it to Rizzle.yaml, which is what it's going to be searching for. So let's look in there and see exactly what it looks like. All right, so up here we have our Nailgun config. Uh, the default is just to go to localhost with some, you know, blah, sat username and password. Um, for our RZA configuration, we have our config file listed in there and then our genetic algorithm configuration. Uh, by default, we allow dependencies and recursion. Um, our grading criteria, which is important for the genetic algorithms, maps the values that we get from the API, so like a 200, a 404, and assigns actual point values to them. This is what our um, algorithm needs to evolve towards a better goal. So, um, of course, we have a 500 ISC um, getting negative 1,000 points. So if you do a seek bad, you're going to get um, very quickly uh, converging on 500 ISCs if it happens to find it. All right. So we also have um, the configuration for max generations, recursion information, as well as population count. And at the very bottom here, we have our default log level and then our log path. For our logs, um, at least for genetic algorithms, every um, test gets its own log. So we have a subnet create positive log in here. Um, however, uh, right now, and you can specify a different name, um, our brute force testing, since there will probably be a lot of them, um, just get a default session and then some just random string dot log. And you can go in there and you know check them out at any point. All right, so with that, we'll go back to our presentation. All right, we just went through the current state of RISA. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Now let's move on to challenges. Um, in here, I'll be talking about product high availability, compute, computation time, um, modeling input, understanding the output, and then delivering information to real people. <laughs> so for product high availability, Availability. Um, simple tests have thousands of possible combinations, and more complex ones, as I said before, have uh, billions and trillions of combinations, especially if you're doing uh, brute force testing. So it's going to be submitting a lot of requests that are very taxing on the product, um, especially if you're running those asynchronously. It's very easy to overwhelm uh, the product itself. Um, I know that a lot of our stuff are written on kind of um, – higher level languages like uh, Ruby, etc., maybe even Python. And um, it can be a bit easier to overwhelm them than you would maybe with uh, something that's running straight on C or something like that. Um, so it's, it's kind of important to have a product that has pretty good high availability. And this might be a way to advocate uh, from a QE perspective of getting um, as much performance out of your product as possible so you can test it really intensively. Um, my vision is to have tests uh, being run constantly once this is set up properly. All right, so computation time. So the problem space of any modern project is massive. As you saw with uh, satellite, we have a lot of entities. Um, each of those entities has a number of methods. Um, each of those entities also has a bunch of fields. Um, the methods have arguments, um, and all of those have to be provided input. So um, each one of those adds an additional dimension. So here I have a picture of what's no, 
it's a two-dimensional heat map. Um, it, it's very simple. It's basically if you just have, you know, one ND and you're just passing in uh, different types of input to it or different values for one type of input to it. That's just a two-dimensional test. It's uh, pretty simple. Um, but you add in one more parameter and now you have three dimensional space add an additional you're into four dimensional space etc so it can be very quickly pile up and um, not only is it hard to visualize it's kind of um, hard to get a grasp on just how big that problem space is uh, thankfully genetic algorithms help to reduce the exploration time uh, just by the very nature and of course you're going to need um, dedicated resources. You don't want to be testing um, using these methods on anything that um, you're going to need to verify bugs on or you know, demonstrate how stable your project is to uh, some type of outside or something. All right, so now we're getting uh, more into um, actual like prediction type stuff. Um, so for modeling input, um, most predictive models require numeric inputs and output numeric values. Um, so we need a way to translate everything into new val numeric values, whether that be an entity, a method, um, a field, any input methods, it all needs to be numerical. And this can be one of the most difficult challenges. Um, something I have been exploring recently is using uh, what's known as tokenization to uh, kind of translate all these different things into numeric values. And then that might be a potential way forward uh, for actually modeling the input itself. And as you'd expect from uh, modeling input, we also need to understand the output. Uh, this is even more challenging, especially if you want to do it on just a, a more simple level than what Riz is able to do right now, which is just searching through the results and checking out explicitly defined strings that were put in our configuration file. Um, we really wanted to understand what the feedback the product is giving. So in here in the picture I have, um, it says no schema, no schema was supplied, perhaps you meant, and then a URL. We actually want our products to be able to, in the future, um, not only translate that into numeric value, but to know what that means to learn what that means and adjust its behavior accordingly, just like a person would. And then all this wouldn't make any difference if we weren't able to deliver the information to real people. So if you have um, a visitor or whatever your implementation is running in the background, it doesn't do you any good aside from just stress testing your product if you can't actually look at what it's been doing and get pretty quickly an idea of what's working, what's not working. Um, people don't like logs for the most part. Uh, people like graphs with colors. As you see here on the right, we have our um, Jenkins interface with the tests that are um, running against our system. And we can very quickly see what's failing, what's passing, and then we can also drill down from there. This might be one of the easiest challenges that I've defined um, to tackle, as I'm sure there are ways uh, to leverage existing libraries for most of the work of uh, parsing logs, uh, finding failures, finding passing things, and then presenting it in a way that um, is, is pretty easy to comprehend for people without having to pour through hundreds of log files. All right, on to future goals. Um, we'll be talking about fully automated testing, highly efficient testing, uh, NLP, which is natural language processing to adjust feedback, and then frameworks that actually understand the software. So what do I mean by fully automated testing? As I said before, I want it to be constantly running against your product. Um, this goes back to the high availability part. You need a product that can actually withstand this. Um, you need to do your cleanups, but have it constantly running against your product so that way um, it can constantly find things that do or don't work, any type of regressions, etc. 
Um, one of the benefits of machine learning is that it doesn't have to sleep. So most of us like our time off. Um, we like to spend time with our families. This doesn't have a family. This doesn't need time off. Um, so while it's constantly running, it will be checking for existing functionality, any type of new functionality. Um, it will output rolling reports to any type of location. Um, you may want to limit them or have it, you know, cut off old uh, reports just so it doesn't, you know, overflow whatever system that you're using. Um, this way we can come in later, um, maybe at the beginning of our day or at the end of our day and check what it's been doing. See if it, you know, actually returned anything that is um, pretty interesting and maybe need to file a bug for it. Um, we want it to notify us of... Uh, new regressions, newly passing tests. So we get a new version and we see, hey, this test is breaking now. Or we get a new version and we say, hey, this was failing, but now it's passing. Um, maybe we're expecting that to be the case, maybe we're not. So we can review that. Um, I want it to have basically little to no human intervention required once it's running. All right, so for highly efficient testing, um, if desired, it can run tests that uh, only historically fail or only historically pass. Um, to an extent, we do have this right now with RZA, where it has um, the prune functionality, which is basically a happy path mode. So to run all the positive tests that we know, notify us and delete anything that fails. So we already have basically the happy path mode. Um, and it would be pretty easy to switch it into exploit mode. So it'll run any negative test that it, pat that it failed. And maybe if um, we want, it can return uh, another notice if you know something that's a stored known bad part is now passing. Um, another way is it can um, we can have it skip any previously tested paths and focus only on anything that's uh, new. So maybe for RZA, it'll check through. Um, so you just want to genetically test all entities. So it can check through um, the data genetics folder and skip anything that it already knows about, and then move on uh, from there. Um, and Part of its efficiency is you can test the entire product or specific entities, methods, and input methods. Um, the way that RISA does it is you can specify the entity and method. Um, we don't have it, so we can actually specify individual input methods, but maybe that's something we can do in the future. All right, so for NLP to adjust feedback, um, natural language processing is a set of techniques techniques that allow a computer to understand human language uh, to at least a decent extent. So if you have um, an Android or Apple phone, you either have uh, Google Now or Siri, I believe, uh, for Apple. And when you talk to it, uh, to an extent, it will understand what you're saying and it uses natural language processing for that. Um, that's kind of one thing that I want to incorporate or thing into um, any type of machine learning tool that we use um, because it'll become necessary to understand the feedback that it's given, like error messages, so um, it can adjust what it's doing. And uh, this may be the best application for neural networks, if not um, determining different input types. So uh, we we'll use NLP to read what's coming out of the API and then feed that back into the neural network. So next time that it tries to test something, they'll say it'll be weighted to either use or not use that depending on what the output was. And in the and the end of all this is to have a, a framework that doesn't just run uh, tests that you um, explicitly program in it um, every time that you get a new snap, but a framework that actually understands the product. Um, it knows what is supposed to work, what isn't supposed to work. It can report on any new issues as well as fix ones. Um, is able to identify new features, automatically test them, and notify about any results that it gets. It basically does the QA so we can focus on the QE.
Okay, so now we'll move on to my final thoughts, uh, Jake's final thoughts. The single greatest barrier to entry for us is resources. Um, we may have some machines to test against, um, but really to develop this, we're going to need resources um, such as people, um, time, uh, energy, and focus to actually um, incorporate the things that I'm talking about, our challenges and future goals. Um, it's not really easy to get started testing with machine learning. It's getting easier now, um, but it's worth it. And in my opinion, machine learning will be incorporated into most industries, and QE should be no different. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can contact me at the email address listed on there. You can also find me on IRC in multiple rooms, but these are the two most common. And then on Freenode IRC, you can also um, pick me out on hashtag Robotello. And if you miss something, there's another recording, but it's not as expensive as this, which is something I've included in the slides. And if this is part of an email, then I'll also email you the link to these slides. Um, feel free to um, throw me an email, hit me up on IRC, whatever you want. If you have any questions, really ask them. I love answering questions. And if you want to contribute and don't know where to get started, also ask me. And of course, PRs are always welcome. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great day.